Uh, so lots of kind of full circle things uh, coming together for me today. Um, <laughs> uh, I was a Salt Lake Community College um, alumnus, or you know, student 20 years ago. And I think it was actually this building that we had our leadership um, class in. So, uh, and I think I uh, actually performed <laughs> with the Salt Lake Community College chamber singers on this stage about 20 years ago too, 23 or 24, I don't know, I went here for a little while. Uh, does anybody take any chamber singer classes? Anybody happen to be in there? Well, if, uh, <laughs> if, if that's of interest, I would recommend looking into it because I think Lyle Archibald is still teaching here and he's phenomenal and, and uh, it's a great experience and we meet lots of really cool people. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I've been really trying to figure out, okay, what, what kind of message do I want to give to you guys? What kind of advice can I give you? Um, and, and it's tough because you look at your own life and, and you're like, well, I'm just doing my thing, you know? <laughs> um, but, but everybody's life is unique and there's experiences that you're gonna have that um, could benefit somebody if you share it. So I'm here to kind of share what my life path has been because it's certainly taken me places that um, I never would have expected. Um, so uh, so um, I wanna share some of that with you uh, as well as offer up some, I think, uh, behaviors or um, ways of, of, of conducting yourself uh, professionally that, that will lend itself to, um, to rewarding experiences and, 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 and hopefully a rewarding career. Um, so, uh, so my log line here <laughs> is dream big, right? Uh, that may come across as kind of, well, okay. So I'm gonna get a little frou-frou on you guys, just a little bit, but I'm gonna mix in, you know, everyday practice, professionalism stuff, because to me, the two things um, lend themselves to, um, to success which is what I think everybody's after. And at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about success, at least uh, uh, what, it, what it means to me, what I, what I think it is. Because um, I think it's really different for everybody. But I think most Americans kind of get it caught up in the, you know, how much money you have or, or whatever else. And it's so much more than that. Uh, so let me just, um, let me just give you a little, synopsis of my life. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I was pretty, um, well, when I was a little kid, I knew for sure what I was gonna do, right? I told everybody, unabashedly, I'm gonna be in TV. No questions asked, like I just knew it. And so, <laughs> I was that little kid that was always running around trying to put together plays, and I wanted a video camera so bad because what I wanted to do was just make movies. And um, I didn't have a video camera. So if I ever found out that somebody had one, I was all over them. I'm like, okay, can I borrow your camera? And, uh, and so as soon as I had one, like, I wouldn't even, I didn't even have really a, a, a thought prepared on what I wanted to film. I just had to find a VHS tape, pop it in there, and movie magic, right? Um, so that was, that was my childhood dream, was to really get into television, get into movies, and produce stuff. Um, in my fifth grade class, I, um, I stumbled across a closet full of costumes and props, and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at all these cool props, like you could do a really cool show. And there was a Christmas record that my family had that was from the 50s and it was like these kitschy songs. And I'm like, I'm gonna put on a production with these costumes for Christmas. And so I went up to my teacher and I'm like, hey, can I put on a show for the class? 
And I wrangled a couple of my friends into it. I said, come on, let's do this. Put on that costume during this song. And, the, and basically, we were just dancing around the classroom you know, with costume changes in between each song. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was totally into it, just totally in heaven with it. Um, and then in, uh, in junior high school, there was a talent show. And it's funny, Jen, as I look back on these things, a lot of these things I didn't drag. <laughs> <laughs> so, like we were Gem and the Holograms, which is a movie that's coming out now, uh, I think in the next year, which is so funny. Um, it was a 80s cartoon about these uh, girl rockers and they were the bad girl rockers. And anyway, so they had this theme song and for the talent show, um, there were two, they would split our class up into, t you know, the school because not everybody could fit in the auditorium, they do two episodes of it or whatever, two sessions. And word got out after the first session about Gem and the Holograms and how great it was and whatever. And so there was, uh, so when we did the second show, it was just mania. Everybody was all over it. It was the talk of the town. <laughs> and uh, so that was a big thing for me because it was something I'd produced. Um, then as I got into high school, was in the drama class, one of our assignments each year was to shoot a short film. I did some uh, slasher films, did sci-fi films, um, and absolutely loved it. And then uh, as I got a little bit older, just in between high school and coming to Salt Lake Community College, um, I spent some time abroad and got real serious about life, and I'm like, oh, what am I gonna do when I got back? I was like, all right, I gotta figure out, I gotta be serious about what I'm gonna do. And I had gotten into a space where it was more about what other people's perceptions were of me or what I thought they thought I needed to do. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna be a chiropractor. <laughs> and so when I came to Salt Lake Community College, I started taking the classes to get into, they were basically pre-med classes lots of chemistry and biology, and, and I think my budget class was next door here too. Um, and was just really focused on, on doing that. Uh, was actually on the dean's list um, at that time. But it wasn't quite clicking for me. Um, and I finally got to a point where it was like, you know, I would go to my chemistry class and I'd find myself doodling and I'm like, this isn't good. Like, maybe I'm not supposed to do this. So what is it that I'm supposed to do? And I couldn't quite figure it out. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna go and do classes that interest me. So I joined the chamber singers and started taking piano lessons and <laughs> things that were, you know, production and music oriented. Um, and Jen actually talked me into taking a musical theater <laughs> uh, audition class, um, which was really, really great because uh, through that, I met some other people and had uh, shared with them kind of my past of doing production and loving music and, and all this stuff. And, and there was a... a, a, a a deep-rooted dream that I had, which was to be um, <laughs> to be a rock star, right? I had gone to a, a New Order concert in uh, up at West Valley, or, or not West Valley, what's it called? Park West, it's called the Canyons now. And I remember being out in the crowd and watching that show and feeling the energy uh, of that show and just going, wow, that is the coolest job ever. I want to be a rock star. I played no instruments. <laughs> Didn't even really sing at the time other than maybe in church here and there. Uh, and, but I had made a decision. I was like, I'm, I'm going to be in a band. That, I'm, I'm going to be in a band. So fast forward again. Uh, in the music audition class that we took, um, I'm 
ended up getting a lead role in, in, a, in the Murray City production of Fiddler on the Roof and met some really great people through there. And one of whom, we were hanging out backstage one night and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna share this crazy secret that people's gonna think so dumb. I wanna be in a band. And she's like, her name is Stephanie, Stephanie Chatterton. She's, uh, she's like, oh really, that's so cool. She says, my brother's in a band. And, and so maybe I'll talk to him. I'm like, really, does he need like backup singers or something? She's like, well, let me talk to him. So that was that, she, we, we wrapped up the play and I've still kept in touch with her over the years as well. Um, and one day, right out here on this courtyard, there was a dance. This was probably, I don't know, three or four months later. And this complete stranger comes up to me and he's like, Dave Pack. I'm like, hey. <laughs> and he's like, you want to be in a band? I'm like, who are you? <laughs> And it was Stephanie's brother, and he's like, hey, my sister told me you wanted to be in a band, so let's form a band. I'm like, so awesome, okay, well, you know, what do you want me to do? And he's like, you can be the lead singer. I'm like, whoa, that's so awesome, lead singer. Um, so we got together and we practiced, I think, like four times, and there was a talent show. So much has happened here, it's like for me. Um, there was a talent show here, I think over one of these other auditoriums, and, uh, we're like, okay, well, we're going to do the talent show at Salt Lake Community College. And we're going to do um, With or Without You by U2. So we get out there, and Nate was his name, Nate Chatterton. He, goes, he, he comes up, and we're like, all right, who wants to rock? People are looking around like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so we did this horrible rendition of With or Without You, and it was really bad because um, that song kind of needs drums and it was just me and Nate and our friend Mark with a guitar and a bass guitar, electric guitar. So, I mean, you know, it wasn't great, but I was in a band, it was awesome, like dream come true. And we went on to play all around town and we actually got pretty good. We um, produced an album and didn't sell any, but you know, it's like, we produced an album. We'd play around bars around town and, and do all sorts of stuff, and it was so great. And I share that because it's okay to have dreams, and I think for a lot of us um, in our culture, you know, people say dream big, but don't dream too big, because you might be disappointed, you know? Just, it's kind of like, a mantra of a dream big, but it probably is not going to happen. So um, I say dream big, dream big. Go after what you want. And it's when you start to incorporate into your life what you think others, people's perceptions, or, or uh, what other people see you doing. Um, that they think what, you know, what's better for you, that's when it starts to get messed up. It's really gotta be about what you want. And, and it doesn't have to be big, you know, band, rock star, movie producer stuff. And it, and it doesn't even have to, unless that's what you want it to be. And, it, it, but, and if that is what it is, it doesn't have to be, well, I produced a Hollywood blockbuster or, you know, I sold, two million albums and I'm touring with, you know, Taylor Swift. It doesn't have to be that to be successful. It's successful if you're getting satisfaction out of it, if you're doing something that you love. Um, and so the challenge, I think, a lot of the time is really getting clear on what it is that you want. And trying to leave at the door um, what you think, you know, maybe your parents want or whatever else. I, I feel bad. My mom wanted me to be a chiropractor so bad. <laughs> and, and that was the main reason I think I went after it. And it's, you know, she wanted the best for me and, and she thought I'd be good at it and I probably would have, but, um, but it wasn't what I really wanted. What I wanted was, I knew what I wanted since I was a kid. I wanted to be in TV. And, and it's funny because I kind of just 
ended up there <laughs> um, professionally. And I've made a career out of it. Um, so backing up just a little bit to, to when I was here at Salt Lake Community College, I was taking you know kind of the fun classes and, and knew I had to figure out what to do as a profession because um, five years at Salt Lake Community College, you know, you got to figure it out at some point. So my brother-in-law saw me struggling a little bit with making a decision around um, my career. I was working at Applebee's part-time, going to school, just really not going anywhere except having a blast doing what I loved. <laughs> um, and so he took me out to lunch one day. And he's like, so, so what are you gonna do? You know, what, are you gonna continue to go to school? Um, Cause I was gonna graduate with my associate's degree in general studies. I'd taken enough classes <laughs> that I had everything here for my generals. And so I'm like, okay, well, I can figure out when I figure out what I want to do, I can take my generals and I can kind of go someplace and whatever. Um, but anyway, this lunch with my brother-in-law, um, he's like, well, what do you see yourself making? And I just kind of thought, well, money. <laughs> I'd never put a figure around it, really. I mean. I want to, you know, I want to, who doesn't want to be rich, right? But I never put a number around. He's like, what do you want to make? 60,000, 90, what is it? What's a number? And I'm like, wow, oh, that's a tough question. And, and so a friend of mine who was the drummer in our band had just started at, uh, his full-time job at oh, 1-800-CONTACTS, and he's still there, by the way. Um, doing great and he told me he shared with me that uh, he was making twenty eight thousand dollars and I had been making about six thousand working at Applebee's <laughs> six thousand yeah a year um, so when he told me twenty eight I'm like oh my gosh that's so much money and so I'm like okay well hmm, I gotta do better than Jason so thirty I need to make thirty grand and so there it was. I had a goal. It was, it was, a, it was very defined, uh, other than I didn't know really what I was going to do to make 30 grand, but I had a number. I had a goal. And so it was just an interesting conversation, and that was a real turning point for me um, to really start to look at valuing myself and, and seeing... Uh, seeing myself as being compensated uh, with a certain number, right? Um, so I drank my margarita that he bought me, <laughs> which he didn't like, uh, and uh, went on my way and decided, okay, well, I'm going to figure this out. Shortly thereafter, Jen had been working at KSL, and she reached out to me and she's like, hey, there's a job at KSL doing traffic, which traffic is where you schedule commercials and that's what it's called. And it was a part-time thing. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll check it out. And so uh, I did apply and I didn't have a lot on my resume at the time. I had been like an assistant manager at Little Caesars during high school and, and had waited tables and that was it. So. I'm like, I'm kind of struggling for something to put on this resume, so I put, I'm just a nice guy, you know, at the bottom. And it turns out that that was something that caught the manager's eye. And so she called me in for the interview, I got the job, and it was just a part-time job. I'd go in after school and do data entry, um, and then filing. And then, so I was doing that for a few months, uh, graduated from Salt Lake Community College, and my boss approached me and she's like, well, do you want to work full time? I'm like, okay, I, that sounds good, and maybe I'll figure out what I want to do with my life <laughs> at some point. So I started working full time at KSL, and, 
Ended up working there for two years and just kind of moving around the department. I moved from just typing in sales orders into scheduling the commercials, into yeah, um, editing the logs and just all the different positions within the department as things moved around. I'm like, well, I, I want to learn how to do that. And so I learned all the bits and pieces and the functions of the jobs, and I learned the software that they run it on. So after that, after being there for two years, I was like, you know what? It's a big world out there. I'd been wanting to get out of Utah for a really long time. Just, I wanted to be in California, really, because it's California. And, <laughs> and so I decided that I was going to take a leap of faith and move to Las Vegas, which was halfway there. And I thought, if I hate it, it's close enough to home, I can just move back. So I went down there, and it was my experience on the system that was used that got me the job at KLAS. And again, it was more of the same stuff, um, but I had become so proficient with the system that there were two departments that wanted me. So there was the one that hired me, but then another department found out that I knew all this other stuff, and so they offered me a position in that department with a the, with the pay raise. And at, and, and at that point, I think I was bumped up to like 20, 23,000, maybe 22, which I thought was absolutely amazing. And, um, but for me, I had this, oh, it's the $30,000 barrier. I need to be able to break that, that $30,000 barrier. And so, uh, oh, so backing up a little bit, sorry. When I was still working at KSL, some, we were changing systems. So some technologists came in or some consultants that were moving everybody off of the old system onto the new one. And I got to know those people and I'm like, well, what, you know, this is what you do. You just travel around and help people change systems. And they're like, yeah, it's really cool. You get to travel around. <laughs> I'm like, that's a cool job. Then I moved to Vegas, got the job at the TV station and just met someone and mentioned casually to them, I'm like, hey, when I was in Salt Lake, I was working on a TV station, these consultants came in and they had this really great job. They just get to travel around and implement systems. And, and this, um, this guy who wasn't, he, um, that I was talking to, he's like, hey, you know what? I know somebody that, that does that. Do you want me to, you know, give me a resume? And I'm like, sure, totally. So I sent it off. Next thing I know, I'm getting a call from this company in Denver looking for consultants. And so they like flew me up there, um, brought me into the office, you know, went through the whole interview process. And they asked me, well, how much do you see yourself making? And I'm like, well, you know, and I was kind of sheepish about it. I'm like, it was gonna be a lot of money. I said, you know, I just, I really wanna break the $30,000 barrier. And they're like, okay. Well, it was nice to meet you, thanks for coming up. They call me the next day and they're like, all right, well, we want to offer you the position and we're going to pay you $34,000 a year. <laughs> I was like, holy cow, I broke the $30,000 barrier. That's awesome. So all of a sudden that meant, well, okay, now I need to raise the bar, right? Like, okay, well, what's my next, what's my next goal? And... <laughs> I was like, you know, okay, well, maybe 60, because I come to find out some of the consultants and stuff made like 60 uh, grand with their experience and stuff like that. And so I was doing that job for a couple of years, just traveling around implementing systems, and Black Entertainment Television was one of the clients that I went to. Spent actually, you know, on these implementations, they can take months. I mean, it's a big deal. You have to move basically their whole. Uh, revenue system onto a new one and make sure that nothing gets screwed up while they're still, you know, going to air with commercials and programs. Uh, so while I was working out there, obviously I got to know the people there. And then when I was back in the office in Denver one day, there were people t talking. They're like, okay, well, there's a job at BET and it's for a, a, a 
a director of traffic position and it pays 120 grand and I'm like holy cow 120 grand that's crazy do they whoa and I'm like well you know what I don't have the experience to be a director but it doesn't hurt to throw my hat into the ring so I submitted my resume and I didn't get that job <laughs> someone else got it but a few months later, some of the people that I had worked with while I was out there, uh, well, one of the persons uh, gave me a call and he says, hey, are you still interested in a job at BET? And I'm like, well, yeah, what you got? And he says, well, I've got a system administrator position open uh, and you know, I think you'd be a good fit. And I said, well, what's, what's the pay? He says, well, it's 65 to 85. <laughs> <laughs> a year. I'm like, perfect. So, interviewed for that. They offered me the job and um, actually paid to relocate me to Washington, D.C. Um, and I, they started me out at the bottom, which was 65. <laughs> which was great. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Uh, and so as I got out there, it was interesting because they already had a system administrator and my position seemed a little bit redundant. And um, they had me reporting to somebody who, who was moody. <laughs> so you never knew like if you were gonna get your head ripped off or if you know, they were gonna be nice to you. And uh, so I would actually would come into work every day thinking, okay, they're paying me all this money and I'm not doing much, you know, and I'm gonna get let go. So, um, so what I had to do was whenever somebody would call me for, because basically I was there to help whenever there were systemic problems with the application. And so when people would call me, I would be like the master customer service person. Like, okay, whatever you need, okay, let me figure it out. And, uh, and so they would throw whatever they could at me and I would run with it, even if I didn't even know really how to do it. Um, and there was a, a like custom reporting application that I basically taught myself how to use. And all of a sudden I found everybody coming to me for these custom reports. They're like, okay, well I need this report that does this and it needs to be in this order and blah, 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 and stuff told this way and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> And all of a sudden, I was the go-to guy for report writing. Um, and they let the other guy go. <laughs> I felt a little bad about that. But you know, I was really, really scared but that I was going to let go because I was the newbie and, and whatever else. But I went in and I, my strategy was to basically just do whatever I could could to make myself visible and make and 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 useful um, and it evolved from there into implementing other systems and it, it went from managing one application to managing seven and um, and I made myself basically indispensable to them because nobody else knew the processes nobody knew the oval oval overall arc of process I went in and I educated myself on the life cycle of television is basically what it is. You know, you start out with advertisers, right, that need to put their commercial on the air to, so people can see it and they'll buy their product and whatever else. So advertisers come in and they, they say, okay, I want to spend this much money. I want to reach these many eyeballs with this, this demographic and, um, and so what you got, well, we've got this program that these people watch, and so if you put this commercial here, you'll get so many people to see it, and it costs this much. <laughs> and then it goes from there into, okay, well, you have to piece all that together. There's timing of programs that are broken into segments, and commercial breaks have to be so long, and uh, there's all these rules that go into it. Uh, and then you have promos that go into there that promote the shows that you're gonna watch, and then you have to go through the process of actually putting that all packaged together, then put it into a system that puts it out on broadcast, pins it up to the satellite, sends it out to people's TV, 
then you have to prove that it aired and make sure that it gets invoiced right. So there's like this huge arc and there's all of these applications that support that. And I just learned how to do all that. And, and whenever there was a, a, a problem that needed a solution, all of a sudden I was the person they would go to, okay, well, how do we solve this? And I would go out there and I would see what there was um, for off the shelf software packages. And I'm like, well, there's this, or we could look at doing custom development work, have consultants come in. And, and so all of a sudden, like I said, I was kind of the go-to guy. So a lot of this <laughs> happened kind of haphazardly. Um, but at the same time, there was something guiding me from within to point myself in the right direction to make things come into my life. Or not make them, but you know, if you, if you want to drive to California, you kind of know how to get there, right? It means you have to get in the car, you point the car in the right direction and you drive, and you're probably going to get there unless you take some really bad wrong turns. <laughs> so you may not necessarily know how long it gets, you know, it's going to take to get there, but you know where you're headed, you know what you want to accomplish. And so you just kind of drive there and, and, you know, you may get a flat tire along the way and you don't have a spare, but someone will stop by. I mean, there's just all these variables that can happen, but you know eventually you're going to get there. So while all this stuff is happening, uh, working in the business side of the biz, uh, uh, at the same time, I was doing, I was wanting to do the production stuff, right? I was really, really focused in my late 20s and early 30s on, on making the, the technology business, TV business job work out because it, it was, you know, it was just working out and it was going great. But when I got to my mid 30s, it was kind of like, well, this is great and it's very rewarding and I'm making good money and, um, but is it really what I want to do? <laughs> and I, and that was the point in my life when I was about 34, when I went, you know what, I've always known since I was a kid what I want to do. I want to produce TV and movies and whatever, entertainment. Uh, and so I started exploring what that trek looked like. What, how do I get on that road? Um, and lo and behold, Jen shows up again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had kept in touch, but there was all of a sudden this phone call one night and we start talking music and she had just got a job at Guitar Center so that she could buy gear and get a discount. And so we're like, well, hey, let's start, you know, writing some music and putting some stuff together. And so we started collaborating on, on some things and, and writing. Uh, and a couple years later, I decided that I'd had, well, there was a number of reasons for it, but I decided that I needed to move back to Utah. Um, <laughs> and that's a whole nother story in of itself that I won't go into, because um, it was kind of nuts. But, um, but I moved back, and immediately Jen and I, we were together, and Next thing I know, we're like writing screenplays and planning on doing all this production work. But we didn't have, we didn't even have a video camera. <laughs> but we were gonna do it, by gum. <laughs> and so, of course, you have to, and it was a better approach, I think, to write it first, rather than get a camera and just hope magic happens, like I did as a kid. Uh, <laughs> And so we started down that road. We're like, okay, we're gonna produce movies. Oh, and before that, sorry, I keep skipping things. When I was still, when I first discovered, okay, in my mid-30s, I'm gonna be a, 
I want to make movies. There was a festival, a film festival that I had heard of called the 48 Hour Film Festival. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. But basically what it is is you form a team, you show up on a Friday night, they give you a film genre, a prop, a character name, and a line of dialogue. And you have 48 hours to go out and write, shoot, edit, fully produce the short film and turn it in. It's really kind of crazy. Um, but when I was out in DC, I'm like, I want to do that 48 hour film festival. That sounds amazing. And lo and behold, somebody showed up who worked at American University in their film department. And she's like, oh, I can, you know, I can totally do this with you and help you make arrangements for equipment. And um, basically the, the 48 hour film festival thing didn't happen in DC. But when I got out here, and it didn't happen in DC because I was scared. Uh, the day of the thing, I was like, called up my team members. And I'm like, I can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so when we got out here, got together with Chen, we did our first 48 hour film festival. And it was pretty awesome. I mean, it came together. And ever since then, things have just been coming together. And so I've formed uh, a production company and we've been doing short films, music videos, um, some commercials, corporate videos, things like that. And it's, it's so rewarding, mostly because I'm actually doing what I love doing. Still have my day job, still love my day job. It's great, but my car is now headed towards where it's really been headed towards all along since I was a little kid is to be a producer. Um, and, and now that I have that clear vision, the road I think will be a little bit shorter getting there. I mean, we're kind of, we're kind of there, but it's not the day job yet. So that's the goal, right? Um, so, God, there was so much other stuff I wanted to get to, but I got a little tangenty. Um, anyway, for you guys, just have clarity. Have big dreams. Have clarity on what it is you really want. And I, once you're clear, you start building your goals around getting there. And, and a good place to start is valuing yourself. Okay, if, if, if money's a factor in it, right? What do you what is the number that you want to make? And you'll be really interested to see who shows up in your life, what things start to happen when you have that clarity. Um, it's kind of freaky, actually. So, so give it a try. Clarity on your, on your goal. And start taking the steps to get there. The question was, um, has the change in technology had an impact on my job or what I do, right? And absolutely it has. Um, <laughs> the industry is completely in a tailspin um, because there's so many outlets now for content, um, which is a good reason to get into being a producer of content because there's so many outlets that are gonna need it, right? Uh, but as far as distribution of that content, everybody's trying to figure it out because, you know, back when I was a kid in the 70s, there were three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, and everybody watched it. So you had millions and millions of viewers. But now with cable and now with Netflix and, and Hulu and, and, and Amazon Prime, everybody's choosing different ways to, con and just DVRs, right? Because nobody really watches the commercials uh, unless they absolutely have to. Um, and so it's tough, advertisers are trying to figure that out. Like how do we reach people with, with to, you know, to brand ourselves? Um, so you've probably, I don't know if you paid attention, but you know, HBO, probably the, the most seismic shift was when HBO came out earlier this year and they said, uh, we're going to offer up our own subscription service. <laughs> uh, 
freaks out Comcast. That's why you see Comcast like getting into, you know, home security and and other avenues. And you're seeing AT and T merge with um, Directv. There's all these big mergers because they have to diversify. Um, because nobody's really figured it out, and I don't know that they will. I mean, the music industry is still trying to figure out what their business model is, since everybody can download stuff for free. And uh, so there are big challenges, and and technology is the biggest has the biggest influence on all that, right? Um, and and I think technology is going to have the biggest influence on every industry because it. It's just how it is. Everything gets smarter. Everything gets automated. But the question is that if they, with all the, all the different things being produced that can be consumed so quickly, is basically what you're saying. Do you think that there's going to be more stuff to produce? Um, absolutely. Um, I don't know that the binge watching thing, just because people can consume it, necessarily means that there's going to be more produced, but. There's just so many outlets, and they're all going to need content. Now, what I'm wondering is, is, is when does the quality of the content start to decrease, maybe? Because you know, you've got like Game of Thrones and uh, these super, super highly produced TV shows that take a ton of money to produce. If, if, if it gets so saturated with so many providers of content, um, that the, that the money's not there, I, I just wonder if we'll ever see an impact uh, on, on the quality. But, you know, Netflix hasn't nailed a totally good business model, and they're just cleaning house, and so everyone's trying to play catch up. And so I think in the next um, couple of years, you'll see more companies like Viacom and whatever offering their own subscription service, rather than doing what most people have been doing, is just paying, you know, a hundred and something bucks a month for all these channels that you don't even watch. Thank you.